I got a theory that I've verified over 9,000 times. What does the scouter say about it? Verification level! It's over 9,000! What 9,000? There's no way that can be right! Could it? Best believe it's scientific. Can you falsify it? What? Can you perform an experiment with the express purpose of trying to prove it wrong? I don't need to. I have over 9,000 verifications. If you want this to be scientific, then you better falsify it. The it looks like you made a wrong turn a while back and ended up in one of my strange corners. Buckle up, buggeroos. Last time, we looked at what the definition of a scientific hypothesis and a scientific theory is. In this video, we'll go deeper and focus on the scientific part. In philosophy of science, there's a problem of demarcation. Demarcation involves establishing boundaries, in this case, the boundary between a theory being scientific or pseudoscientific. We ask this question because we need to know what gives a theory scientific credibility, and all the scientific authority that comes with that. 20th century philosopher Karl Popper was especially concerned about this question of demarcation. During the first half of the 20th century, and still to a certain extent currently, a theory was considered scientific if you could objectively provide confirmations or verifications of your theory. Verificationism was all the rage, and all the coolest cats gathered in circles to verify each other's egos and beliefs. The confirmation theory of science is based on induction, which we talked about in greater detail in this video. But the TLDR version is, induction works by taking multiple discrete instances of empirical evidence, and from those infer a general rule or principle. For the instance, every time I drop my pen, drop my pen, drop my pen, gravity makes sure it falls downwards and not upwards, seemingly confirming that gravity is real. Not only does this seemingly confirm that gravity is real right now, but from these instances, we could also predict that all future instances would also confirm our theory. For most people, this makes perfect sense. Can't find an example of your theory? Then it must be wrong, right? Philosophically, though, there are some really big problems with induction. 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume wrote probably one of the best critiques of induction. He said we couldn't establish, quote, that those instances of which we have had no experience resembled those of which we have had experience. Hume goes on, quote, even after the observation of the frequent or constant conjunction of objects. Don't give me that constant conjunction doesn't imply causal connection. It's yours. <laughs> Even after the observation of the frequent or constant conjunction of objects, we have no reason to draw any inference concerning any object beyond those of which we have had experience. Because we do not have experience of the future, it is beyond our ability to predict what we haven't experienced yet. Furthermore, any attempt to justify your theory using past experiences, using induction, requires us to keep using more and more past experiences to show the causality Ad infinitum. Ad infinitum. Ad infinitum. Whoa now, induction. Don't get us trapped in an infinite loop. Hume will actually go so far as to say we can have no knowledge of natural causality. We can go into more detail about Hume, who I personally think is dope as fuck, in later videos. Popper relies on Hume for his critique of the confirmation hypothesis. If we only look for confirmations of our theory, we can typically interpret almost any event as a confirmation of our theory. For the instance, It's my theory that all the best philosophers are handsome, have long, luxurious hair, and big bushy moustaches. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Oh, yes, darling. Oh. Finding confirmation is really easy, and for Popper, just because you can find confirmation doesn't make it scientific. During Popper's time in the early 20th century, certain theories like Karl Marx's theory of history or Sigmund Freud's theory of psychoanalysis were typically considered scientific. Both Marx and Freud explicitly said they were doing science in developing their theories, using the German word Die Wissenschaft. But Popper noticed a problem with these. 
they couldn't be proven wrong. Quote, These theories appeared to be able to explain practically everything that happened within the fields to which they referred. The study of any of them seemed to have the effect of an intellectual conversion or revelation, opening your eyes to a new truth hidden from those not yet initiated. Once your eyes were thus open, you saw confirming instances everywhere. The world was full of verifications of the theory. No oh, shit, it's really fucked up. Here I am, this little kid, and I can't stop drawing dicks to save my own life. My parents make me go see some therapist, and he's asking me all these dick questions. They literally made me stop eating foods that were shaped like dicks. No hot dogs, no popsicles. You know how many foods are shaped like dicks? The best kinds. Yeah. Whoa! Hopper continues, quote, Whatever happened always confirmed it. Thus, its truth appeared manifest, and unbelievers were clearly people who did not want to see the manifest truth, who refused to because it was against their class interests. Those selfish kulaks and bourgeois pigs! Or because of their repressions, which were still unanalyzed and crying out for treatment. You see this cigar? It's your father's penis. For Popper, the confirmation hypothesis could not possibly be the demarcation line between science and pseudoscience. Hypotheses are designed to explain observations, but all observations are related to the needs and interests of the observer. Quote, Observation is always selective. It needs a chosen object, a definite task, an interest, a point of view, a problem. Observations come with a set of presuppositions that justify the interpretation of the observation. Observations are always underpinned by a frame of reference, expectations, and already existing theories. When we rely on confirmation to demarcate our theories as scientific, our expectations always precede our observations. Popper says this is dogmatic thinking, where we quote, we expect regularities everywhere, and attempt to find them even when there are none. Dogmatic thinking upholds or reinforces our already existing theories and the prejudices that come with them, whether by denying conflicting evidence or creating ad hoc solutions that allows the theory to escape refutation. We usually think of dogmatic thinking when we think of theology, which is focused on absolute obedience to a divine power. But it's common across different fields of study, including in the sciences. An example of this is biological racism and eugenics, which presupposes or insists there must be some real qualitative difference between the different races, differences which are inferior and superior to each other. Starting in the 19th century, theories of biological racism were considered scientific based on observations and experiments whereby quote-unquote scientists went to great lengths to show and exaggerate physical differences between races, physical similarities between black people and apes, cranium differences, etc. And the scientific authority that came with these theories contributed to race-based slavery, legal discrimination against people of color, and of course the horrors of the Holocaust and colonial projects. Because these scientists were literally prejudiced, they ignored all conflicting evidence that shows that there are clearly no biological difference between the races. So if we can't rely on confirmation, where do we draw the line between science and pseudoscience? Popper says, quote, The criterion of a scientific status of a theory is its falsifiability or refutability or testability. When we perform an experiment or search for any observation, we should be trying to falsify our beliefs. We should be trying to prove them wrong. Figure out a hypothesis and try to prove it wrong. This is critical thinking, or as Popper describes it, an, quote, attitude which is ready to modify its tenets, which admits doubts and demands tests. Let's return to our gravity experiment. Every time I drop my pen, I should be trying to see if it goes up instead of down, challenging my existing beliefs. And if it doesn't go down, I need to accept that my theory of gravity is wrong. 
Every time we test a theory, in order for that test to be scientific, it has to be an attempt to refute the theory. Didn't you have a mustache? Whatever, don't worry about it. Falsify it, bitch. Any theory which cannot be refuted is not scientific. Quote, irrefutability is not a virtue of a theory, as people often think, but a vice. Popper says every good scientific theory is actually, quote, a prohibition. It forbids certain things to happen, and the more a theory forbids, the better it is. Prohibitions allow us to more easily see the flaws in our own theories. Popper was especially enamored with Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity, particularly in the way Einstein offered three specific tests which would either prove or deny his theory. One, general relativity could explain the changing perihelion of the planet Mercury, or the point in its orbit where it is closest to the sun, which Newtonian physics could not properly account for. Two, general relativity predicted gravitational lensing, or the way light is bent by the curvature in space-time caused by massive objects. And three, general relativity predicted that gravity can alter the spectral lines of light by shifting its wavelength and therefore its color. By the time Einstein's theories of special and general relativity were translated into English in 1920, both one and two had been discovered correct. Yet even with these two confirmations, Einstein was willing to falsify the whole theory of general relativity if the third one was not discovered. Einstein said, quote, if the displacement of spectral lines towards the red by the gravitational potential does not exist, then the theory of general relativity will be untenable. The first accurate measurements of the gravitational redshift didn't occur until 1954. In 2019, the first accurate imaging of a black hole showed gravity could also cause light to blue shift, and the extreme gravity of the black hole allowed light from the other side of the black hole to be visible to us. You can learn more about this amazing discovery in this episode of PBS Spacetime. Popper describes his theory of falsification as a method of trial and error, quote, of conjecture and refutation, of boldly proposing theories, of trying our best to show that they are erroneous, and of accepting them tentatively if our critical efforts are unsuccessful. Popper's theory means, quote, all laws, all theories remain essentially tentative or conjectural or hypothetical, even when we feel we are unable to doubt them any longer. By requiring skepticism always be included with our theories, Popper says, quote, we thus obtain the fittest theory by eliminating those which are less fit. The scientific method, or the method of trial and error, is a process whereby only the fittest hypotheses survive because we force them to endure refutation after refutation, and only accept confirmations tentatively. It's important to note that the critical attitude is not opposed to the dogmatic in the sense that they are contradictions. Critique only exists in relation to dogma, and logically, dogma is prior to critique. As Popper says, quote, A critical attitude needs for its raw material theories or beliefs which are held more or less dogmatically. The critical attitude is a reaction on top of the dogmatic attitude whenever dogmatic theories become increasingly untenable. Reflecting back on the problem of demarcation, it is clear the critical attitude is scientific while the dogmatic attitude is pseudoscientific. And the pseudoscientific attitude is prior to the scientific attitude, which is what demarcates the old theories as pre-scientific. For instance, it was Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo questioning the geocentric theory of the solar system that the Earth was at the center of both the solar system and the universe that began to demarcate it from their own heliocentric theory. However, just because something is pre-scientific does not mean it has no real content. Myths and religious texts do pass on information. The scientific attitude begins with the critical discussion of myths, magic, and metaphysics. For Popper, the demarcation line between pseudoscientific and scientific is that while the former does pass on its theories, it is only with the latter that the critical attitude is also passed on. Why do so many people believe in the scientific method? Because ostensibly it has self-correcting mechanisms built into it. We could say that Popper uses a method of very hesitant induction, where we create a hypothesis based on past observations, 
but tried to falsify it with our future observations. Yet one of the problems we ran into with induction earlier is we have to rely on more and more past observations, seemingly going back ad infinite. Would Popper's induction not also require us to go backwards in an infinite regress? Well, not according to Popper. The earlier theory of induction we looked at was based on objective discrete instances that didn't technically require a human be present to witness said instance. But Popper flipped the script by exposing just how subjective our observations of these instances are. All of our observations presuppose already existing theories. Popper says, quote, There is no danger of an infinite regress. Going back to more and more primitive theories and myths, we shall in the end find unconscious, inborn expectations. Popper does not mean inborn expectations are logically a priori, but he does believe they are psychologically and or genetically a priori, i.e. prior to all observations. Humans have an innate desire or instinct to make similarities between different instances, to recognize patterns, to identify similarities. These instinctual expectations are a beginning for all the beliefs, dogmatic or critical, we might have, and according to Popper, we aren't stuck with an infinite regress here. Now, a lot of scientists hate falsification and philosophy of science in general. There are many critiques of Popper's theories that we can look at in another video. Next time, though, we'll look at different types of theories and see how they hold up to falsification. Leave your ideas for theories to test in the comments below. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh, the confirmation. Thanks to all my patrons, and special thanks to Alan the Axe of House Axelrod for their contributions.